<laughs> Good morning. Welcome to the metrics and activities meeting. For those who don't know, we go through what we did last month. We look at some key metrics uh, for the last month. This is going to be a pretty short one. We only have a couple talks, uh, interesting ones, I hope. Uh, we'll be done in about 30 minutes, I'm guessing. Uh, let's start with uh, who we added to the organization in the last month. Uh, welcome to Karen Zwicker. Is she here? Karen, do we have a Karen? Could you stand up? Karen, Karen, Karen. Welcome. Our Stellman. <laughs> hey, Rachel. And Anthony. Do we have Anthony? OK, great. Welcome to Anthony. And Jessica and the legal intern farm boot camp, whatever. OK, great. Well, welcome to all. And Jody, did you want to say anything about the HR updates? Do we have a Jody? <laughs> Do we have a Jody? <laughs> OK. Well, let's just put the slides up. This is just our standard update. You can read those if you're excited about your payroll update. <laughs> OK. Um, going on to the top line metrics for the last couple months. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the main report card that you find at reportcard.wmflabs.org. Um, there's nothing really exciting to report. What we're seeing in the uh, the month-to-month -month data is what we expect to be seeing at about this time in the year, um, which is a seasonal increase in the number of active editors, which is the key metric that we pay a lot of attention to. So we do see January, February are good months, uh, months this year. Um, but that tends to be the case seasonally, so it remains to be seen whether we actually are seeing a sustained increase. Um, what I did want to uh, dig into a little bit more is some new analysis that Eric Zafte and Dario have been working on, uh, which I think is interesting and worth sharing and worth sort of wrapping our head around a little bit together. And that's a different kind of breakdown of the active editor data than we ordinarily do. So uh, usually we focus on the total or the, the by project views, um, but this is basically uh, the view of uh, the English Wikipedia versus everything else in the universe. And so what you see in this data is actually some uh, something very interesting, which is that the significant share, the most significant share of the drop in the total active editors is really just due to the trends in the English Wikipedia, which is the dark blue line here. So the English Wikipedia, you can see, has a very pronounced drop in the active contributor numbers over the last seven years, whereas the other projects actually have a uh, significant sustained increase for a long period of time and a long period of stability. Um, that is all Wikipedia, so that doesn't even include like the increases that are due to Commons, Wikidata, um, and other uh, new projects uh, that were launched. So that's interesting in the sense that we sometimes get criticized for focusing a lot of our energy on EN Wiki. Uh, a lot of the projects that we launch launch on EN Wiki. A lot of our experiments focus on EN Wiki. But the truth is that EN Wiki is, as far as the data is telling us, the most significant sort of source of um, a potential decline, a potential drop across um, the Wikimedia editor population. Um, what's also notable is that if you look at the non uh, Wikipedia wikis, you're really just seeing a story of increase in the population. It's a smaller uh, population, but it's a, it's a generally pretty positive story. And if we dig further into that, and we really just focus on these uh, in thousands on the, on the left hand on the uh, y axis, if you look just at the uh, the projects in this chart, that's Commons and Wikidata, uh, are contributing basically the major, uh, the, almost the entirety of that trend that you saw at the bottom line in the previous chart. So Commons has been really uh, seeing a tremendous growth uh, in con contributors over the years. Um, as, we, as most of you know, these are the Wikiloves monuments uh, spikes. Um, but even without them, uh, Wikimedia Commons is trending upwards. Uh, and Wikidata is a much shorter story so far, but it's a very impressive one. And the active editor population in Wikidata continues to grow. Um, and this is the non-bot, the, the human population. Um, the bot population of Wikidata is pretty huge. 
or Metamask. Um, question from IRC. Do we know what caused the huge drop in 2013 in non-English Wikipedia projects? Oh, sorry, non-English projects. We don't, but uh, this is a question that I've uh, asked the team to look into a little bit further because I looked uh, at that chart as well and noticed that uh, tendency. And my suspicion is that it may be correlated to what we saw in the page view data during the second half of 2013 as well. We haven't really done a very focused analysis between viewership and editorship, but we know that in the second half of 2013, we also saw a significant drop in PVs. Uh, which seems to now not uh, not be continuing in the first couple of months of 2014, but we'll see if it uh, continues later in the year. But we want to know better and understand better how um, viewership is correlated with editorship. So that might be the answer, but we don't know yet. So, hi. Dan Gary. Hi. Um, so can you go to the was it the next slide? Mm -hmm. um, so the Wikidata thing, it said it's excluding bots, but there's a few OAuth tools which are quite highly automated, but, but due to the mechanics of OAuth, those edits get made through the person's account. And some of these have like hundreds of thousands of edits that have been made through them. And then Does that, that this, include that? Well, keep in mind that this is the five edit threshold. So this doesn't really look at the productivity of people, but it looks at unique people. Right. So Gerard makes... So those people would already have been included edits. anyway into, into, the, into that. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So the automated tools are not going to drive that number uh, up particularly because they're not going to increase the number of accounts right. that perform edits. OK, thanks. And then the other version um, of uh, the other way to look at this data is to really look at the small projects, which I think is worth doing from time to time, um, because you see some interesting trends there as well. So for instance, uh, Wikisource really has a continued story almost of continued growth throughout um, most of its ex existence to date, and is now um, starting to exceed Wiktionary in terms of its editor population. We haven't looked in more detail yet at what's going in there, on there, but it's definitely um, interesting. Um, the other thing to note here is that WikiVoyage um, had an insane spike uh, in January when the project was launched, and we blasted it to everyone through banners, um, but it stabilized at about the 350 active editor population since then. And finally, I think it's also worth looking at like the tiniest projects and how they're doing. And what is interesting to note here, these are the smaller projects that are in decline. And what's interesting to note here is that Wikinews is basically dead at this point. Like, you know, really, it has an active editor population of less than 100 uh, individuals at this point in time across all the Wikinews languages combined. So I think at some point, we need to ask ourselves the question, what does failure of a Wikimedia project look like? And what does an active editor population look like? Dario? Yeah, so um, for Wikinews particularly, we know that a large shift of activity around news has uh, moved towards uh, Wikipedia. So there's a large share of editing on Wikipedia around uh, breaking news topics. So that's maybe one of the reasons for that. But I just want to comment that um, this is just the first uh, preliminary take at this data. And it, it originated from a spin-off from a request from The Economist. And we're going to spend the next, uh, probably the, pro the next month uh, uh, digging further into this data. So if you have any questions, just feel free to reach out. Yeah, so this was a, a sneak preview of um, some more detailed analysis that will follow. Any questions at this point, other than what we already talked about? I have one. Toby? Thanks. I have. So, I think this is really, really interesting, and I really like the more nuanced approach to what editing actually means. I, it seems like there's also a connection between the size of a wiki and the number of editors and the editor growth, which is also something that that I think the amount of content is something that we'd also like to look into because I think this this gives us some insight into how wikis actually work and how collaborative uh, editing actually works. Um, and so, yeah, I think there's going to be a lot of um, really interesting conclusions coming out of this, and hopefully we can help reframe the, the, the editor uh, story, um, both internally and externally. So I think this is, this is great work by Eric and Dario. Okay. So I'm going to move on to um, the presentations, and we're going to have 
one update from uh, Fabrice and Mark on the Media Viewer project. So Fabrice, I'm going to pull up your slides. Do you want to start with the slides or the demo? The slides. Okay. Well, can you confirm, Chip? Sorry. Can you confirm that the slides are coming through? Fine. Okay, great. Hello again. Uh, last November, we showed you um, some of the first stages of Media Viewer. It's come a long way since we showed it to you. Um, and what we'd like to do is do a little bit of a demo um, of some of the new features that we've been working on. Um, so the overall purpose of Media Viewer is to give a better viewing experience and in the process engage more users. Some of the new features that we're going to be showing you are next and previous, the ability to browse through a collection. A lot of improvements on the metadata panel so you can get more information about the file you're looking at. Much faster image load and uh, some great improvements on the full screen experience, which is a lovely site. So I'm going to turn this over to uh, Mark, who's going to show you a demo of what it looks like on Commons. Um, and I'm going to pass it to Mark and then tell you more about what the next steps a little bit later. Okay, so here we have a, a big page with a whole bunch of images. We're not going to run out, I hope, in this demo, but uh, clicking on any thumbnail when you have the preference enabled will open up the light box. And like Fabrice said, we are loading images way faster now. It used to be awful to load images in this thing, but it's super fast. Uh, and Browsing through images is as easy as clicking the arrows on the right and left side of the screen, or just the arrow keys if you prefer that. You'll notice that the images basically aren't loading at all as you go because we preload the next and previous images now. Uh, it's a neat little trick to make things look a little snappier. Uh, if we go really fast, we can see a blurry image loads first to give you the impression that the image is already there, and then we load the bigger image when we have it. And You'll notice that down here we have the title and the license and the creator of the work. If you scroll down, you get a lot more metadata now, including the description and the caption, if there is any, as well as a uh, little dialogue that's a little ugly right now, but we're working on that, uh, to use the file in pages in HTML, wherever you want to use it. Um, the uploader name here, if it's different from the author, uh, as well as the creation date, if there was geolocation data on this image, you would see that. I'm not sure if we have any that do. Um, probably not, but uh, if you have special permissions that aren't just like normal vanilla CC by SA, you also have a link here to view the terms in the viewer. Um, and it says here, oh, nothing special, just that, uh, just that the Flickr upload bot had done something with it and it wasn't sure about the licensing, I guess. Um, oh, I guess here we do have geolocation data, and that brings you to the geohack site. So uh, a lot of information getting passed in here. And uh, Oh, and full screen, right. The Grom is do full screen. Full screen is getting way prettier because we don't even have metadata on it now. In fact, we hide your cursor. We hide the controls. You can browse without anything else showing up and it gives you nightmares, but also really pretty images. <laughs> um, and if you really want to see the title, you can hover on the metadata div down here, and it'll show you the, the little bit that we show you above the fold. You can't scroll down in the full screen view, but going back to the non-full screen view is pretty simple. So then you can see more metadata. That's all we've got. Thank you, Mark. So to put the slides back up.
Isn't that lovely? I mean, we basically are transforming the basic user experience to folks who come to Wikipedia and adding a whole new multimedia layer to uh, what is usually perceived as a text um, only uh, or mostly uh, information source. Someday people may come in through that multimedia layer and then dive down to read the articles. And so we think this is a very hopeful uh, development. We're very happy with how uh, well the uh, application is shaping up. Next up, we're going to have a better version of Use This File. So you'll have a little Use This File button in here, and it'll give you the option to share, embed, or download the files with full attribution to the author. So when you plop it in onto another website, it gives you all the proper credits. We'll have uh, the ability for users to opt out, great metrics dashboards, uh, reader feedback survey, and of course a bunch of site configuration options for uh, the uh, launch. And speaking of launch, uh, we're going to do a gradual release of Media Viewer. We're finding that gradual releases are really the best way to get these features introduced. Starting with pilot releases in April, MediaWiki first, then some small pilot sites, then some larger pilot sites. Wikimedia Commons, and then full release on all wikis in the May time frame. At, during that time, we'll start working on Media Viewer 0.3, which is going to have um, more audiovisual supports, uh, video and audio files. Here you're seeing a design by a pal Janair of uh, what the video might look like with you know sound controls, ability to display um, subtitles, uh, slide capabilities, uh, Zoom, mobile, and plugins. And I just briefly want to show you what the Zoom is expected to look like. Uh, so you would basically be able to click on the Zoom button and uh, Zoom gradually, and you'd have a little navigation panel that would let you go through all the different variations. Uh, so uh, keeps getting better all the time. Um, next up on our plate for the multimedia team this year is to work on the upload pipeline work on structured data on commons, really, really important, file notifications, feedback, and of course, lots of technical debt. And all this is made possible by an awesome team. It's great to have a full team, and there's a lot more than just these folks. There's the folks from the design team, Pau and Katie, and uh, folks from the community liaison team. Really grateful to have uh, such a, a great opportunity to improve multimedia experience. So what one thing you guys can all do if you want to is help test Media Viewer. It's now in Commons, uh, as well as on MediaWiki.org, and there's links on our multimedia sites where you can find out more about it. Enjoy the new Media Viewer. So, so I want to put this a little bit in context, uh, because what Fabrice didn't show is the current experience of viewing images. And I think it's it's just worth sort of you now reminding ourselves what it looks like right now. Uh, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> that is the current experience of viewing images. That was not intentional. Apologies. OK, if that was vandalism. Someone might want to fix it. So this is the actual uh, file description page in uh, EN Wiki. So what you see here is that it's basically uh, the way it works in the software is that files are handled by inserting the image into what's effectively like just a normal Wiki page. And the end result is that if you're a new user on Wikipedia, you have to sort of figure out why am I on this page called file something, which has got a name in it. And what is this um, page that I'm looking at? You're now actually looking at a image from comments, so you can't even edit the page. Um, and you have to sort of figure out how all of this stuff fits together. Then if you go to comments and you try to make any changes to the metadata, it's all in this template format that you have to parse out, which is very inconsistent from file to file to file. And what the media viewer team had to do in order to even be able to build this thing is to um, make sense of this, right? Because it's very inconsistent. Every image expresses the metadata slightly differently. And so there's a metadata parser that is part of the project that basically just tries to extract and make sense of what is this license of this image? Like, is it a Creative Commons license? Is it public domain? And display it in the right place, which is very hard because 
they are inconsistent. So as you use MediaView, you might sometimes not find the right license under the image or no license just because the system is inherently imperfect and, and fragile to do the way it, it works in the back end. So really where we need to go, and what, what Fabrice pointed out in the last slide uh, with the structured data piece, is actually not have this type of structured metadata that is currently handled through these information templates um, actually handle in this way, but handle it through Wikidata, uh, through the Wikidata software. Um, the proposal that's on the table by the Wikidata team is to essentially run a version of the Wikidata software uh, customized for the purpose of managing image metadata and file metadata on Commons. Um, that, in turn, would, it also make, would also make it possible for us to not force you when you open an image in the media viewer to, uh, if you want to edit any of this stuff, go to this weird page. But we could start thinking about, like, in place editing of like the description. We could start moving away from the file name being the thing that needs to be highlighted, because the one identifying tool we have right now are file names, and they're often poorly chosen, misleading, and not actually helpful. So there's a lot of work that we have to do in the back end uh, still to build a modern user experience. But I think the, the viewer piece was basically the low-hanging fruit to try to get that out, out of the way and to, in fact, showcase some of the amazing media that we have in our projects, which, like, if you're a photographer in, in, in uh, Wikimedia projects so far, it was has been a frustrating experience that none of the work you do actually is showcased in a way that is warranted. So I'm really excited about the progress you guys have made. Can you turn on the feature? Of course. Hmm? No, it's a candidate. Um, I want to take this opportunity while he's doing this to thank all of the community members who have helped us with this uh, through roundtables, through our C chats, through our mailing list. This has truly been a partnership with many community members from Commons and Wikipedia, and it really, really shows. Thank you all, community members, if you're hearing this. So to turn it on, you just click on the beta link in the toolbar, and then you click the checkbox next to the relevant um, feature, which is the Media Viewer. And that is the new way that we are staging features in general um, to get like a population of, in this case, on Commons, a thousand early adopters who are going to tell us all the things that we did wrong um, before we uh, inflict it on the general user population. So uh, 12,000 beta users right now worldwide and more coming. All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you. And the last presentation is an update from Keenan on the tablet user experience. And we're going to have to switch horses, so hopefully that won't go wrong, but we'll try. Exciting. <laughs> um, so yeah, I wanted to uh, to talk to you all a little bit about what the mobile web team has been up to. Um, this quarter, the work has been really focused on um, tablets. Um, so the what you're seeing up here right now is um, coming out from my tablet, and uh, it is a um, slide from Mary Meeker's presentation uh, from a while back. Uh, that talked about um, basically tablets surpassing uh, desktop sales uh, about a year ago in, in Q4 of 2012. Um, since then, um, in the foundation, we've been thinking about you know how we're going to deal with tablets, um, and wanted to show you a little bit about uh, what we've been doing so far. So. Um, Right now, uh, if you visit uh, Wikipedia on your tablet, this is kind of what you see, right? So it's uh, the desktop experience, um, but just on a tablet. Um, and it's uh, A, like kind of hard to read, uh, and B, um, not uh, super well designed for um, a touch interface. Um, right here is uh, the experience that we're moving towards. Um, so or not, that we're moving towards, this is what's been built uh, already, actually. 
Um, so you'll see that um, that it has a lot more space, um, that it's a lot more readable. Um, the table of contents we've got here, um, all this is based uh, on what has already been done um, in the mobile front end, but uh, there have been you know, quite a number of changes that we made. Um, all the sections uh, which are normally collapsed on a handset are auto expanded uh, for tablets so that people can uh, read kind of leisurely through without having to expand all the sections on their own. Um, and uh, one thing that I also wanted to show was um, this same article in um, an RTL language. Um, so uh, one of the things that you'll see is that, you know, we've definitely made an effort to make sure that, um, that you know the reader experience uh, is 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 really nice on RTL as well. Uh, part of that has been um, sort of new discoveries uh, that there are some projects out there, namely um, Korean Wikipedia and uh, Arabic Wikipedia, that are very um, sort of that mobile is is very important on. Um, and so that's one thing that I wanted to show there. Uh, the other thing. Um, that's really exciting uh, is that uh, along with um, the move to put tablets onto the mobile version of the site, um, we're also enabling visual editor uh, for tablets. So if you click on uh, that edit button, um, what you'll see is that uh, now visual editor loads uh, within this tablet experience uh, and you can edit visually and see uh, a bug. <laughs> um, but uh, it's a really exciting um, uh, uh, partnership uh, between our team and the visual editor team. Um, and so uh, one of the, one of the um, uh, requirements that we had going into this uh, was to make sure that um, that editors didn't see any significant deprecation going from the desktop experience to the mobile experience. So that was um, an important uh, aspect to make sure that we met that requirement. Um, and then also just making sure that the editing experience, you know, is, is pleasurable for uh, users on a tablet device, um, which, you know, is basically makes uh, editing with Wikitext even harder. So, um, so yeah. So some really exciting stuff uh, for tablets. So is, is, is VE the default now? Um, so what you'll see is um, this is the alpha experience. Um, within alpha, VE is the default. Um, we're working on um, adding basically a switch edit modes button. Um, one thing that is going to be uh, sort of a change is that um, in the desktop site, there are two different edit buttons. Um, we're, our plan is to merge that into one edit button, but then have a, a, a basically a switch edit modes. Um, and then if you switch edit modes, when you go back to edit, you'll stay in whichever mode you had previously. That yeah. That would be great. Yeah. That is the plan for the desktop in the, yeah. in the long run as well. Yeah. It's just hard to get right. Other questions? Comments on the tablet experience? And is that, go ahead. Is this working consistently across all tablets, all operating systems right now, or did you start with a couple? Um, we've been testing across uh, iOS and Android, um, which uh, I think is is the overwhelming population of tablets right now, um, and in fact, actually, uh, iOS uh, is like the dominant player in this in the tablet market right now. Um, so uh, we're getting pretty good coverage in terms of um, in terms of our testing. And then you know it's it's web technology. So ideally, Windows mobile tablets should operate similar to uh, similar to you know iOS and, and Android too. Yeah. And will the same design principles be applied to the new apps? from the start as well? Um, so the apps um, are 
right now are handset focused, um, but they do function on tablets and, and actually um, look look quite nice on tablets as well. So, Got it. Yeah. Other questions for Keenan? All right. Thank you, Keenan. <laughs> Before we wrap, uh, Sue so wanted to give a quick update on the ED search. You have a mic already? I do. So Eric told me that um, because it's a really light meeting, I don't have to be quick. <laughs> no. And so I might not be. I don't know. I might take a little more time, and I have an extra topic in my back pocket that I might um, go to as well. Um, and so the first thing I want to say was, I am so happy to see you all, because I kind of have missed you. I've been traveling a lot, and I was sick for three weeks, which sucked. And I've only been back for about a week or so, um, and I haven't seen you in a long time, and I'm just really happy to see everybody. Uh, so I wanted to update on the ED search, and I am a little torn on it, because I am so deep in the weeds in it and thinking about it all the time and having lots and lots of meetings and stuff about it, that it's hard for me to kind of pull back out and both remember what you guys know and kind of empathetically step into imagining what you might want to know. So I would encourage you, please, um, as I do an update, if you have questions, just to ask them. And don't worry about kind of self-censoring what's appropriate and what's not, because I'll keep that in my mind. So if there's something that you ask me that I really shouldn't answer, I'll just tell you that. Um, so I think we last talked about the ED search in December, if I'm remembering right. And I think that that was right after we decided to, in effect, kind of reboot or restart the search. Is that correct? Is that the last that you guys have heard? Thank you. OK. And so um, I will then recap a little bit. So what we decided at the very end of November, beginning of December, um, was that the search had gone well, and it had been very um, you know, thorough, and we had surfaced lots of candidates, and people were super interesting, and there were some really um, competent and really interesting people. But ultimately, we felt like we learned a lot both about the substance of the job and the kind of person that we were looking for, and we learned a lot about the process of recruiting for a position like that, which this organization has not done for a million years, right? Um, and so we felt like if we restarted, relaunched, rebooted, um, we might end up with a slate of candidates who was even more awesome um, than the folks that we were meeting with at that time. And that turned out to be true. And so what, one of the things that we learned in the first go round was that in our part of the world and in the kind of work that we do, uh, people aren't necessarily used to having a recruiter reach out to them directly. They actually tend to do this kind of hiring more through word of mouth and networks and friends of friends and that sort of thing. And so at the beginning, actually I did this in December, but again in January, I went on a little mini tour and I was in um, four or five cities over 10 days and had 26 meetings and coffees and breakfasts and lunches with folks putting out the word and talking to people in like-minded organizations who would know us and know people who would be suited to us. So we did it in a much more personal, direct, informal way. And that got us um, a whole ton of new candidates who were super interesting. So that was successful. That was a good thing. And you might have seen some of the scratchy notes from that stuff up on my board because I've been kind of tracking who I'm talking to. Um, and so what has happened since then is uh, we've met with many people. Millions of meetings have been had. Uh, folks have flown to San Francisco, including some of our board members, um, to interview candidates. I've had a bunch of dinners with people. Gail, Jeff, and Eric have had many, many meetings with different candidates. And we now are at a point where we are still surfacing new people, but right now we have three candidates who we all think, everybody on the transition team, thinks are really awesome. And so that's like a great position to be in. So we feel really good. We feel really confident about where we're at. We plan on having um, folks come back in, those three or some subset of those three, come back in, I think, in the 15th of, where's Eric? Did he? 15th of March. 15th of March. Thank you, because I'm lost in a haze of what month is it now. <laughs> um, so the 15th of March, uh, 
the folks will come back in and we'll have uh, sort of final interviews and so forth and then that kicks off a whole bunch of things like reference checking and um, criminal background checking and final conversations about terms and all sorts of things but my guess at this point is that we will end up in a position to make an announcement this is like a wild guess but I'm thinking around the beginning of May maybe as early as the end of April maybe pushing a little bit into May but somewhere around the beginning of May is when we're going to be in a position to say who the person is which I think will be great. So, questions on that? Yes. Do all three candidates have similar backgrounds or do the backgrounds differ? They have fairly similar backgrounds. So, you probably remember when we set out to recruit um, in the beginning, right, the first thing that we decided was that there were two core characteristics that all the can they, they needed a million awesome soft characteristics and style things and stuff, but there were two characteristics that we felt were, were central to the job, and one was that they have a product and engineering background, internet stuff, and the other was that they have some kind of community understanding. And the community piece is a lot harder to define because there are lots of different kinds of communities and self-organizing and volunteer and et cetera. So we didn't um, narrow the community piece to be super specific about the kind of community, but we felt like somebody to lead the Wikimedia Foundation really ought to have some organizing or movement or even perhaps politics, but they had to have some piece of the cat herding element of the job. And when we did our first uh, surfacing of candidates, the sort of phase one of the search, most but not all people fit into that basic ballpark, right? We had a couple of folks who came from um, other backgrounds that are sort of slightly more tangentially related to us, like people who came from the world of education or people who came from what I might characterize as like cultural institutions, non y kinds of places. Um, and I think what we learned in that first round was that we had been right the first time, right? It was worth exploring and worth going a little bit further afield and seeing what that looked like. But at the end of the day, once we were like in, you know, rich conversation with candidates, um, the folks who didn't have some kind of community internet experience really um, didn't have the same level of sophistication about our issues. And I'll tell you that one thing that was funny for me when I did my 26 meetings over 10 days, um, I talked to a lot of people from that background, right, who, you know, may or may not be interested in this job, but, but like who live in our world, right, like folks at Etsy and stuff like that. And it was super fun and super affirming because our world is unlike anything else, right? And the kinds of conversations that we have about cat herding and about people and about volunteers and about distributed groups and all of that stuff, it's a body of knowledge that's not very well documented yet. I'm sure it will be with the passage of time. It's not well documented yet, but that doesn't mean it's not real, right? And you can feel it when you talk to those folks. So they all have those core characteristics to a greater or lesser degree. They all come from that sort of ballpark. James? Hey, a um, couple of questions from IRC. One was, uh, were all the candidates from round one kicked out, or do the two groups overlap with the second after the reboot? And the second one was, what was the international distribution of candidates like, especially those who got onto the shorter lists? Yeah, and so the three candidates who we're talking with right now are all new surface since January-ish. Um, and to the second question, I don't have numbers, um, but I would say from a kind of a narrative perspective, we set out in the beginning to have uh, international experience, right, um, be a reasonably high priority for all the obvious reasons, global movement, right? Um, as we honed in on the search, what we started finding was that the, the hard skills that we need are, generally speaking, most present right here, right, like in the Bay Area. And what we found was that there are lots of people in the Bay Area who are from somewhere else. They have lived elsewhere. Lots of them have traveled a lot, worked lots of different places, and so forth. But I would say that just rough casting my mind back, 
that over half of the candidates who we ended up sort of seriously screening and speaking with were from this rough part of the world, just because that's where the density of experience and the sort of biggest sophistication in this kind of stuff, that's where it is. Okay. Anything else? Questions? Okay. So I'm not, I'm not stopping yet. <laughs> okay, so uh, I have another topic. <laughs> and um, what I want to do on this topic, if you will bear with me, is I want to ask you guys a couple of questions, um, and I'll tell you why, but I'm, I'm going to ask you to vote so or to participate in a poll of some kind, so bear with me as I do that, okay? So we are, um, it is the time of year where I ceremonially um, remind you all that we're launching into heavy annual planning cycle stuff, right? And so um, usually the reason I tell you that, some of you already know it and are deep, 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 neck deep in it. And so the reason I say it at the meetings is because for the people who aren't deep, deep in it, um, their bosses are, right? So what I'm saying is really just be patient with your boss if they're a little bit swamped right now because we are actively grinding um, towards the annual plan. And one of the questions that's going to come up as we do the planning for uh, next fiscal year, and Lynette, I'm doing this partly for your benefit and Garfield's as well as my own, um, but one of the questions that's going to come up is the question of do we take over the fifth floor space or do we continue to restrict ourselves to the third floor and the sixth floor in this building? And everyone knows that that's an open question, right? Everyone knows we have the right to the fifth floor and we've been subletting it out to other people. We reserved it early because we wanted to be cautious. We didn't know if we would need the space, so we wanted to have it um, if we need it. And so we're going to go forward and make that decision about the fifth floor. At some point in the planning cycle, I don't know when, I've rescheduled our meeting a couple times. <laughs> um, and I've been spending some time um, talking uh, by email with some of the director level folks about their preferences and so forth. And I'm going to convey that to you, Lynette, as well. But um, the basic consideration is pretty straightforward, right? It's like, if we need the space, we will take it. Garfield and Lynette are working with Gail on staffing projections, and so we will have a good sense of whether or not we need the space. And it's a cost-benefit analysis, right? It's expensive, but if we need it, we will take it. But there are a couple soft questions um, that I had that I could use a, a sense from you guys of how much they matter. And so I'm going to ask you, I think, four things, and I need somebody to help count, if somebody would volunteer to count raised hands. It can't be, um, thank you, and it can't be James Forrester because you're going to have to count if there are remote people on IRC who, although I don't know that remote people, unless they're just traveling, would have an opinion, but for what it's worth. Okay. So I'm going to ask you, there, are, there have been made to me, I think, four arguments for the fifth floor that go beyond the obvious we need workstations. And so what I'm wanting to test here is the how, how shared, how common, how acutely felt are those needs. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to name four things. I want you to raise your hand if it applies to you, right? If, if it's a reason in your view for us taking the fifth floor. And all I'm trying to do is get a sense of how widespread they are and, and how much need there is for them. You can vote as many times as you want. You can not raise your hand at all or you can raise your hand all four times. It doesn't matter. And Lynette will help me count. So the first question is, um, uh, one reason to take the fifth floor um, that's been raised is that some people, I think particularly on the third floor, may feel that their individual workspace has gotten a little bit overly compressed, right? So some people feel like it's a little bit over dense on three, and so we might want to allow a little more latitude for individual space for people at their own desks. So I am curious. Um, can you raise your hand if you, and this probably mostly applies to the third floor people, but not necessarily, if you feel like your individual own workspace is a little bit too compressed and you'd like a little bit more room yourself. So you need to keep your hand up while Lynette looks around the room. Okay, three, and anything on IRC, I'm assuming no. I believe it's raised for one of my issues. Okay. So five, thank you. Sure, then the, the reverse being, um, you feel like you have lots of space or, or enough space. So raise your hand if you feel like, if you're on three and you feel like you have enough space currently. That's interesting. Eric, Eric on the fence. 
You have a, you have a sofa. Exactly. I have like a whole <laughs> table, so yeah. I don't get to the All right. Thank you. Because. <laughs> Good point. They moved to a different location. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Have we done the math and figured out how many square feet everybody has? Yes. What is it? S square feet? <laughs> linear feet, Robert says. 4.4 .4 linear feet. I've usually heard it in square feet, but we can talk afterwards. Lynette, you need a microphone. If you're going to talk, you need to get a microphone. That's the law. Um, hey. Hello? Yes. Yep. Uh, I think part of the, the uh, sort of divide, I guess, uh, might be there's actually quite a wide variation in um, the amount of space individual people have, right? So like uh, uh, Robler, who I'm calling out because he was the person I could see who put his hand up other than me, um, has a standing desk. And other people have like a two-space desk. And other people have a one space desk and I've got this weird thing that isn't actually in our desking plan but just sits there. So I'm, I'm wondering how much of it is not we have too much space as a group or too little space as a group but just like the, the desk assignments are the individual variation. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, question number two is uh, pressure on um, meeting spaces, right, particularly conference rooms but just in general um, areas in which to have small or large meetings. Um, I had been hearing for a while, I felt kind of angst and noise about pressure on meeting spaces. I wondered if some of it has been resolved by seeming now to have better, more effective booking systems, but I don't know. So open question, uh, raise your hand if you at this point feel pressure on meeting rooms and can't get meeting rooms when you need them and it's a hassle for you. Thank you. I would say all meeting spaces, right? And I might even expand the question a little bit. Like we have talked over the years about having those phone booth type spaces, which we do not have and which lots of organizations like us do have. Yeah, I'd include that as well. Yeah, so basically if you want to meet or have a quiet place to make a call and you can't, raise your hand if that's a problem. And Lynette has looked at the numbers. I'm assuming there's no IRC. Thomas has two hands up. <laughs> do you, do you, you, you have a sense of the room? <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay, okay, here is a question that needs a little bit of preamble. Um, so uh, if we do not take the fifth floor, it's entirely possible that we will need to put workstations in this area, right, as we hire people, thereby eroding um, the collab space, okay? So the collab space is, there, there, I don't think that there is a perfect answer for the question of the collab space because it's already, I mean, people spilling out into the corridor and it's already super crowded and it really doesn't, the, the staff is large enough now that this is not really sufficient as a collab space. But if we were to take the fifth floor, we would be able to retain this or some equivalent version of this. There is no bigger area, but some equivalent version. And, you know, we could maybe use more of this space than we currently do. That would be the kind of current state option. Um, if we don't take the fifth floor, probably one of two things is going to end up happening. This space is going to get eroded, right? We may continue to be able to do some version of this sort of thing, but it's likely that one of two things will happen either there will be increasing pressure on the collab space and people will need to start participating in things like the metrics meeting from their desks, right? Like using Hangout or something because they're, again, the space will get eroded and we already can't really fit anybody into it. So either the collective meetings become somewhat more remote, like they will just have to, or 
it's possible that we would end up spilling over into some other space nearby, you know, a block away or something where somebody has a really proper big conference room. That's kind of bad because it would mean traipsing down the street. It would make it a lot harder to flexibly use the space. Um, and there would be time lost traveling back and forth. It would be a pain, I'm sure, for chip, et cetera, right? So that's not a great option, but that might be what we end up doing. So assuming that the alternatives are either more remote participation in collaborative events, which is not ideal, or pushing some or all collaborative events off-site, which is also not ideal, how important, or raise your hand, if you think it's important for you um, to, to continue to have the ability to use this current collab space, even though it's not perfect, being a better option than the two I just uh, mentioned, the two alternatives. That was a confusing question, so thank you for... <laughs> <laughs> Raising your hand means you like the collab space better than some other possible options. Would you prefer a crappy alternative? <laughs> There's no bias in this question. I, I, it's completely neutrally phrased. <laughs> that is not an option. <laughs> Yet. Eventually. Okay, so, yep, okay. And then, um, and then my last question, which I'm not sure, and, and this is a completely open question because it's been raised a little bit here and there. It's never been kind of satisfactorily resolved. I have a personal opinion on it, and maybe I'm just dredging it up myself and no one else cares. Um, but we've talked over the years about the notion of quiet spaces, places reserved for quiet. It's kind of weird, right, because um, in an open concept office, it kind of everything is quiet space and nothing is quiet space, right? And so we have talked about the idea of having a particular room or a particular area dedicated to people who've got their heads down and they're coding or writing or something and they really don't want other people to talk to them or around them. That could be a conference room like that or that could be a whole area like this, right? My question is, um, do you feel the need, and, and, and I don't mean do you wish people would shut up near your desk or anything that, like that that is not actually going to happen, right? Do you feel the need for a dedicated physical space where you can have your head down and work and not be interrupted by other people? Would that be a helpful thing to you personally? <laughs> Two hands. <laughs> That's a large space. Dunno, right? Like depending on our ability and, you know, how many people want it. Which apparently is a lot. Where is that? Which ones are 36? Uh, Elder? The windowless room with the paintings. The, the pretty HR room? Yes. <laughs> the pretty HR room. <laughs> okay. That's right. Gail gave it up for the common good <laughs> because she is good. Um, okay, that's good, actually. That's good because if we pilot it, then we would know better if it actually gets used. I've seen it used. There's a, a co-working space in Utrecht that I went to where people had that and they used it. It's a slightly different thing because they're not they don't have any reason or need to talk to each other because they're not actually colleagues. Um, but it's a good idea. If it could work, I think it could be really awesome. The wall in that room um, uh, next to Elder is actually really thin. So if you're sitting in that room and someone's having a meeting next door, it's not a quiet room. So I wonder if it makes sense to pilot a different room that is sort of more. Yeah, the other side of the. Uh, it's the one by my desk. It's a little bit. Yes, that's the, that's the one I mean. Yes. Yes, that, that is the one I'm referring to. Yes, sorry. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, that that room uh, does have uh, problems. Um, the reason we selected it as a sort of, or actually, I guess I selected it, and then everyone voted on it, and so fine. Um, the the logic behind selecting it as the uh, pilot room was essentially that uh, if you look at the rooms available, um, you get small rooms, large rooms, medium rooms. Uh, the large rooms kind of a big deal to take over for a test run because people are always wanting to use them. Um, the small ones, very compressed, normally next to other things or, you know, with open plain glass down on third or whatever. Um, uh, the medium rooms, 
we've only actually got a couple. Of the ones that we do have, um, the one sort of furthest away from everything is is that one. Like, we could have picked uh, another medium room, but people would be, like, walking past it constantly. Uh, the, the logic basically is, is yeah, you know, there's, there's going to be some noise if people are in the meetings, but people will be only be going past it if they're going into meetings. Like, there won't be particular foot traffic, and it's kind of a, a quiet area of the office insofar as there are a few desks against those walls. Yeah, yeah, and I think it makes sense um, for a pilot Right? Because if it's a concept that seems to work and that people are actually using, then um, Lynette and Garfield can consider how to best build it into an expansion and a rethink and all of that stuff. Yeah, the, the real question is would it get used? So uh, I personally hate rooms and closed spaces, but I, I definitely need this kind of quiet space. And I want to point out that we have a, a phenomenal experiment downstairs, which is this quiet uh, um, sofas with paper walls which are extremely successful. So I know many, many people on third floor really like them. So uh, quiet space doesn't need to be necessarily a single centralized room. It can be more distributed spaces where people can find Yeah, if that's working, that's super interesting. Yeah. Yeah, I think part of what, what creates some pressure um, to take over the fifth floor is a desire to rearrange the other side of the third floor and create, loosen it up a little bit, put in some sofas, put in like a central table that people can sit around. Like that kind of thing makes it a, a more quiet space. And of course, reducing the number of bodies also reduces the pressure on the room. So I, I think generally speaking, the idea of fifth um, housing uh, some staff and maybe housing like an expanded version of the collapse space makes a lot of sense to me at this stage in the organization development. Yeah, I think so too. It's a money question, and it's a it's a pro staffing projections question, right? And the math will be done. But yeah, I mean, it doesn't surprise me, but I am getting the sense in general from people that they would prefer to have the fifth. I mean, who? No, I do not want the fifth. Like, who would say that, right? That's why it's a money question. Yeah. Okay. Um, Bunch of people on IRC are understandably um, concerned that this will turn into the conversation about this rather than a conversation about this. And that um, people who feel that they're disenfranchised through feeling that the third floor is too cramped for them or the sixth floor or whatever. And so they work from home when they could work from the office and that by working from home they disenfranchise themselves from this conversation and it's kind of catch-22 and they're just very worried. And Would it be possible to, to commit to a wider discussion uh, involving staff mailing lists and so on and so forth just to put people's minds at ease? Put it on, Lumio. Uh, on Lumio or whatever, yeah. I mean, I, I I think that would be fine. I had a small email exchange with Eric that he forwarded to the engineering directors, and that was super. And this is the one that I'm going to forward to you, Lynette. It was super useful for me because people raised stuff that I didn't know was an issue, right? So it was super useful. So I think like a thread or a group discussion of some kind makes a ton of sense, and Lumio does sound like the right venue for that. But yeah. I don't know that people need any support to do that. Like, they can just do it, right? But people shouldn't be anxious. Um, I mean, reading the room and um, based on the feedback and the conversations that we've had, it seems pretty likely that we'll just have to bite the bullet and eat the cost. Thereby affecting my conversation with Lisa Gruel later on today about revenue targets, right? Yep. <laughs> yeah. Um, OK. That was useful for me, um, so thank you for doing that. Lynette, I want to give you the chance, if you have anything that you want to say or if you have anything further that you want to ask people, like I sprung this on you so you're in no way prepared, but if there is anything you want to do. If it doesn't work. Thank you. Hi, everybody. There we are. Um, I just wanted to say that these aren't new conversations and folks shouldn't feel anxious. We have heard, we've done a lot of discovery on the third floor and the sixth floor. We've talked with the directors, people have talked with Robert and I and Garfield individually. Um, don't be nervous about it. I don't think there's anything new. Uh, if you feel like something hasn't been heard about density or what you need or what you want, please, by all means, I'm happy to do anything on Lumio that we think is, is absent or a gap. And um, uh, just let us know. But I, I do believe we've got a good sense of it. And um, one other thing, um, we're talking about this aloud up here, but please, elevators downstairs, anywhere else that somebody from the fifth floor might hear this, don't talk about it. One, we don't want them to know yet. One other final note. The, uh, the conference rooms now have those. The, <laughs> we're broadcasting. The, uh, 
one thing I've noticed about conference rooms, we are there was a, a opinion expressed before that they are hard to get. And with the new information boards, and while I've been setting them up, I've noticed a lot of times rooms are booked and there is no one in there. So please use this as a way to communicate with other people in the organization to say, hey, I notice you always have this room booked on Monday. Maybe it was a reoccurring meeting six months ago that you're not having. Um, so try to use this as an opportunity to police yourselves and uh, let other people know if they are booking a room and then not using it. Thank you. Thank you. I have one more thing. Um, I believe this is true. Someone can correct me if I'm wrong. If you book a meeting with two people and then both of those people decline the meeting, that does not mean the room is not booked. So it was like if you have a meeting that people aren't going to go to, you need to cancel it. Otherwise, the room will remain booked. I think that's true. Someone correct me? All right, cool. Yes, that's all I got. Okay. Is this now off? Hello? <laughs> okay. So, good. That was helpful for me. Um, like I said, I'm going to forward the stuff that the engineering director sent me to Lynette. Um, there's lots of pathways for people to talk to each other about it. People should start something on Lumio if they want to. Um, like I said, the decision at the end of the day is going to be made on the basis of cost and staffing projections, but I do agree with Eric that um, what I'm hearing is that it would be super useful, it would make people's work lives better and more productive, and so that's a very strong argument um, for doing it. So. I don't have anything else for this meeting, and I have used up more than my allotted time, which happily existed. Um, if anybody's got any questions for me, I don't know if there's anything on IRC on any topic or whatever, that's completely fine. Um, if we don't, I'll hand it back to Eric. Okay. And that's it for today. That's a bunch. Thank you.